service is when we get to bow before you, to kneel, and to publicly come and just say, God, my wisdom is insufficient for the day. My strength is insufficient for the day. God, I need your help. I need the life of the body to be flowing through me. Lord, I don't know what we're praying about this morning. Maybe for someone it's a marriage. Maybe for someone else it's the health of a family member, a son, son in law, a daughter, daughter in law. Maybe for some of us it's a business. God, I'm so grateful that you care. And I'm grateful that we can bring our cares and our concerns and our anxieties to you. Father, in just a moment, we're going to open our Bibles. And when we do, we're going to discover an incredible, incredible passage of Scripture. And I just pray, Father, that at this very moment, you would provide us teachable spirits so that as we focus our attention on one and a half verses today, the Lord, we would leave here with a safety net known as the love of God, that we would know it, we would believe it, and that we would experience it. Now, Father, it's possible that there's somebody here who's not a Christian. If that's the case, Lord, I pray that today they would open their hearts to you. Father, as we open our Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open our hearts and open our minds. And I pray all of this thanking you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I do hope that you'll open them to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to continue our series, Walking with Jesus. Remember, uh, we started five weeks ago in this new section on love, and we began by looking at the love of God the Father in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. And then we looked at the love of God the Father and God the Son in verses 9 and 10. And then in verses 11 and 12, we looked at the love of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. And then last week, my goal was to cover verses 13 to 16a, and I only got halfway through with that. So today we're going to finish that section. And as we think about this section, and we're talking about love, I think that it's possible that you might be sitting here thinking, you know, it's easy to talk about love. You know, in seminary, I did a failure for putting my hands in my pocket, so I get those out. But you know, the good thing is, I'll put it right back there. Uh, but I can't take my diploma away. So there you have it. I still feel guilty. Uh, see how easily distracted I am. I think it's possible that you might sing about love, and you might talk about love, but wonder if love is really enough outside those doors. Because I want you to think about John for a moment. John is writing about love. I mean, we've been studying for, for five weeks now. But John's brother, James, had already been martyred. And John's friend, Peter, had already been martyred. And John's friend Paul had already been martyred. As a matter of fact, there, there were no apostles left. They were all dead. And yet John is saying that love is enough. It's enough when you walk outside these doors 
The love of God is enough to sustain you. And that's a phenomenal truth. It's easy for me to say. It's easy for me to sing about. But John was experiencing the martyrdom of a brother, two friends, all of the apostles. In just a few years, John's going to be banished to the Isle of Patmos. Some historians believe that John was dipped in a vat of boiling oil and supernaturally survived. And he's talking to a group of people who knew what it was to be persecuted by the Romans if he just said Jesus is Lord. So for John, this isn't just talk. It's not just singing. John is actually relying on the love of God. And that's where we're going to get to today because in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, he's going to say, and so we know and we rely on the love God has for us. Back when I was a, a, a younger person, my family took a family vacation to uh, California. <coughs> And one of the things that I remember so vividly was driving across the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. Beautiful, just beautiful. But the interesting thing about the Golden Gate Bridge was it cost $35 million to build in the middle of the Depression. And at that time, statistically, they lost one person for every million dollars. One person for every million dollars. So the Golden Gate Bridge should have lost 35 men. But they only lost 11. The Bay Bridge, however, which is just down the road, lost 28 men. Why did the Golden Gate only lose 11 and the Bay Bridge 28? Well, one reason is because the engineer on the Golden Gate Bridge built a safety net under the bridge that went 10 feet on either side. And so the workers worked with confidence. High up, if they fell, they knew they would be caught in the safety net. Susie's grandfather, unfortunately, was one of the men who fell before the safety net, and he died. And those men who died, or those men who fell and fell into the safety net, were called the halfway to hell club, because they survived, and they were halfway on their way to hell, they said. But this safety net, the safety net, kept them working and kept them alive. And so they worked with great confidence. I thought about that. I thought about that safety net. And that's what John the Apostle is saying today. You're going to walk out of this building. And yes, you can sing about love and talk about love. It's so easy in church. It's so easy in Sunday school. But does it really make a difference out there? Does it really make a difference when your brother has been martyred? What about when your friend Peter and your friend Paul has been martyred? Does it really make a difference? And John the Apostle will say, yes. We can rely on the love of God. So if you've got your Bibles, let's look at our one and a half verses today. We're going to Remind you of what we learned in verse 13, 1 John 4, 13. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So last week we simply learned that every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within them. And you know you're a Christian if you have the personal presence of the Holy Spirit. Then we looked at verse 15. If anyone acknowledges, confesses, agrees with the Bible that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Every Christian knows what it is to confess, to 
to agree with, to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And you would do that even in times of persecution. And so John says, if you are willing to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, he is the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, whatever you want to say, if you're willing to say that, even if it costs you your life, like James and Peter and Paul, if you're willing to do that, then we know that you're a Christian. And now today I want you to look with me at verse 14, and here's what he says. So let's read it in context. We know that we live in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he in God, and we know, and rely on the love God has for us. So today we're going to look at all of the ands. So let's start in verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. That word seen is a Greek verb, theonai, from which we get theater. So if you think about it in context, what's he saying? And we have seen the love of the Father. How have we seen the love of the Father? Well, here's what he says. We have seen that the Father has sent his Son. If you go back to verse 9, here's what he says. This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only Son into the world. So by God sending his son, he showed his love. And so John says, we have seen his love. And then he says, and we have seen that the Father has sent his son to be the Savior of the world. So if you go to verse 10, he says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So what John is saying is we have seen that God loves us. We have seen that by virtue of the fact that he sent his sinless son to be born of a virgin, 1 John 4, 9. And we have seen that he sent his sinless son to be the savior of the world, 1 John 4, 10. And John is saying that I have seen that with my eyes. Remember back, in 1 John chapter 1, when John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at in our hands of touch, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, we testify to it, we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. So John is saying, we have seen this. We have seen God's love. We've seen the theater, if you will, the play of God's love. He sent his son, sinless son, to be born of a virgin, so that he might die on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. We have seen the theater. We've seen the play. We've seen God's love played out in our lifetime. John saw it, and the other apostles saw it. But now this word seen really gave me a problem because it says, and we have seen. If that was in the present tense, boy, I would have been okay with that. And if it was in the past tense, I would have been okay with that. But it was in the perfect tense. And the perfect tense means it's something that happened in the past but has present results. And so I was scratching my head. And I thought, now Jesus has been dead for about 55 years now. So I could see how God's love was in the past because John had walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, touched Jesus. I could see how that he had talked about God's love because he was a Calvary. He saw Jesus on the cross. I could understand the past, but I couldn't understand the present. How could he be saying, we have seen and we continue to see for ourselves this love of God? Because Jesus has been dead for 55 years. He's in heaven. How does he see it now? 
And I was so confused over this. So when I'm confused, I do what I tell you to do. I bowed my head. And I prayed because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. Verse 27. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But his anointing teaches you about all things. So God has given us this wonderful promise of the Holy Spirit. That we can bow our heads and we can say, God, I don't understand this. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth, will guide us into all truth. And so I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And then one day it just clicked like a light bulb. John is saying, and we have seen, and we continue to see for ourselves this love of God. How does he continue to see the love of God? If you go back to verse 12, here's what he says. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. John was saying to these Christians around A.D. 95 at Ephesus, by virtue of the fact that you as a Christian love one another, you are displaying the love of God today. That was such a phenomenal truth for me. I got so excited about that, and I can tell that you are as excited as I am as well, but you're just holding back your enthusiasm, and I appreciate that. But I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the fact that John is saying, I have seen the love of God, the theater of God's love, displayed in sending his sinless son, 1 John 4, 9, to be the sacrifice, the savior of the world on Calvary. I have seen that. But I continue to see it for myself. When we Christians love one another, it's a phenomenal truth that you and I have the ability to visibly show the lost world the love of God not by our actions to them, but by our actions to each other. Let's go on. And we have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. I love the fact that John always comes back to the fact that there's one problem, sin, and there's one solution, Jesus. And Jesus is the solution for everyone. Amen. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Remember the story of the Samaritan woman? The Bible says many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and stay two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Then they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. You know, one of the reasons we have events like Easter or the Jason Lovin Band or Todd Starnes coming from Fox News or the Fall Festival, um, one of the reasons we do that is so that you can invite your lost friends. Like the Samaritan woman said, you can tell them, but then they can come and they can meet Jesus for themselves. Jesus is the Savior of the world. The problem is sin. The solution is Jesus. But then John goes on. And we have seen and we testify. We testify, we acknowledge. That word testify is a verb. That's the Greek verb martyrio. And we get our English word martyr from that. As a matter of fact, it's used in Acts chapter 1, 8 as a noun. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You will be my martyrs in Jerusalem, in all Judea, 
and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's a profound statement from John. We have seen and continue to see for ourselves, and we testify, and we are martyrs. Think of what John is saying. His brother James has already been martyred. Peter's been martyred. Paul's been martyred. This isn't just something he's saying. It's something he's experiencing. And all the people in all the church walk out those doors. There's a good chance that the Roman government's going to martyr them as well. So what John is talking about, and we have seen and we testify, or we are martyred, that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. He said, I am testifying. And my brother testified to the point of death. My friend Peter testified to the point of death. My friend Paul testified to the point of death. And here's what they testified. They testified that Jesus is the Savior of the world, which means I, as a believer in Jesus Christ, don't have to suffer the penalty of my sins. I wonder if John wasn't thinking back to John chapter 14, the night before Jesus was crucified, when Jesus said to the disciples after the Lord's Supper, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you that... I may receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. You see, Jesus was saying, look, I'm going to heaven, and you're coming with me. John is saying that Jesus, as the Savior of the world, will keep you and me as a Christian from the penalty of our sins, being eternally separated from God in hell. Being the savior of the world also means that if you have Jesus in your heart, you have power over sin. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, for sin shall not be your master. Sin shall not have dominion over you. I may choose to sin, but I don't have to sin. Jesus Christ has given me the power not to sin. And then the old time church fathers, those who lived generations ago, used to talk about the pollution of sin. It's a term you don't hear much about anymore. But it's what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 7, verse 21. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> when Paul says, that he can be have power over sin and over the pollution of sin. But he's saying that all of us are born sinners. We're all sinners. But the solution for sin, whether the penalty of sin, separation from God and hell, or the power of sin, or the daily pollution of sin, just our sin nature always wanting to sin. Jesus is the Savior, the power over all of that. <laughs> and then he concludes, or actually I'm concluding verse 14 by saying this, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. I believe Back in John chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. 
I believe that what Jesus was saying is that the Holy Spirit's going to come. And he's going to enable you, John, and you, Peter, and the others of you, to write the body of truth that we call the New Testament. And I believe when you look at people like John, they believe with all of their being that God loved us so much that he sent his son, the sinless Savior, to be born at Christmas, that he might be sacrificed as the suffering Savior on Good Friday. And John says that I am operating now in the theater of God's love. I know that I have God's love as my safety net. I know that he's the Savior of the world. I know that his Bible is true, and that's why my brother James is dead. My friends Peter and Paul and all of the other apostles are dead. And that's why some of you are willing to walk out of these doors and say that Jesus is Lord, and the Romans are going to put you in a Colosseum. Because you acknowledge that this is the truth. And you know it's the truth because you have the Holy Spirit within you. John has said all of that, and now he concludes with this statement in verse 16. And so we know the love God has for us, and we rely on the love God has for us. We've seen this word know several other times. For example, in verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And so we know the love God has for us. This is, again, in the perfect tense. And so what John is saying is we have known and we continue to know God's love. And it's an interesting phrase because what he's saying is that if I love you and you love me, the more that we love one another, the more that we grow in our knowledge of God. Amen. So it's sort of like a big circle. The more I love, the more I know God. The more I know God, the more I love. The more I love, the more I know. And so it's a circle. And John is saying that I know the love of God. I know the love of God for one another. The more that I know God's love, the more that I love. And then he ends with this incredible, incredible statement. And so we know and re we rely and continue to rely on the love God has for us. That word rely is the Greek verb that means believe. And you've seen this verb before. For example, last year our theme verse, back in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's the exact same word, believe and rely. We learn that if we want to have God answer our prayers, we have to believe him, right? Amen. Yes. Yes. So what he's saying is, just as you pray and believe, you now need to believe or rely on God's love. It's the same thought that Paul had in Romans 8. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any power, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Same thought. It's the same word found in 2 Timothy 1.12. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him for that day. It's the same word found in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You see, John is saying, I rely on the love of God. I believe in the love of God. Even when my brother is dead, yes. Even when my friends Peter and Paul are dead, yes. Even when I'm the only apostle left, yes. You see, what John is telling us is that no matter what happens in life, no matter what my circumstances are, even the death of a brother or friends, even if the church family goes out in the world and the Romans are persecuting them, for some of us, we would doubt the love of God. Say, where is God in the midst of all of this? But John said, this love, this love is my safety net. This is what I am holding on to. And that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. I walk out of this building and things happen to me. And I don't like them. And I'm sure that John wasn't thrilled that his brother was murdered or that his friends were murdered. Bad things happen. But bad things happening doesn't mean that God has withdrawn his love for us. Amen. And for those of us who are Christians who desperately need the love of God, he said, we know the love of God and we continue to know the love of God by virtue of the fact that God sent his sinless son, yes. God sacrificed his sinless son, yes. But every day, I'm a part of a group of Christians who manifest that love and show that love to one another. And I can rely on the love of God. It depends upon my obedience. I read a story about a man who went to the Hallmark store to get an anniversary card for his wife. They've been married 40 years. Some of you have been married over 40 years. We and I have been married 38 this year. So he goes into the Hallmark store to get a card for his wife, and this young clerk comes up, and she says, may I help you? And here's the statement he made. He said, no, I can't find a card that expresses my love for my wife of 40 years. Now you understand that, don't you? When you're first married, love has one meaning. But after you've been married 38 years, love takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? Just shake your head, yes, you agree with me, please. When, when you go through all of the things you go through in your marriage, when your wife loves you unconditionally, when she puts up with a whole bunch, amen. <laughs> you know, and I have security to do Back again. At two in the morning, when she's driving you to the hospital because you're having a heart attack, love, <coughs> love takes on a whole new dimension. And what John is saying here, now listen closely, what John is saying is, I'm an old man. And he had been with Jesus with Jesus, and now it's been 55 years since Jesus has gone to heaven, but he says, I'm still relying on the love of God. And you and I, when we walk out of this building, if you know God and you know his love, 
<laughs> and no matter what the circumstances are, you can rely on that love of God as your safety net. So let me make a few quick connections. Number one, we show God's love when we love one another. And all I'm doing is asking you, would you be willing to sit with your pastor, to pray with your pastor, and ask God how we could be a more loving church so that we could manifest God's love to our community? I'm not asking how to win the loss to Jesus. I'm not asking how to show love to the lost. I'm saying, how do we love one another better, more? And I'm asking if you'd be willing to help a deacon. Our guys are good guys, but sometimes life is overwhelming. It would just be nice for them to be able to pick up a phone and say, hey, could you help me show love to this person? I'm asking you to examine your life. Are you an obedient Christian? Are you a loving Christian? Because Peter said, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Make sure you're a Christian. Because John told us a Christian is somebody who obeys, and a Christian is somebody who loves. And he also told us a Christian is somebody who has the personal presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So just look at yourself. Do you have the personal presence of the Holy Spirit? Are you loving? Are you obedient? Are you willing to publicly confess Christ? Are you trusting in Christ alone for your salvation? So where will you spend your eternal days? John 1 12 says, as many as receive him, to them he gives the authority to become a child of God. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll finish. And how are you going to live your earthly days? We can be a loving Christian, and we can be an assured Christian. But that's your choice. It's my choice. And will you be a Christian? who walks out of here, no matter what the circumstances are, you're going to rely on the love of God. And will you be a Christian who will obey the Bible to the point where you love one another? And by loving one another, you get to know God better. As you get to know God better, you love one another. Your choice, loving and assured, is open to you if you're willing. To be obedient. Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for this day. And now, Father, we live in a world where it just seems is that wickedness and evil just keeps growing exponentially. And how wonderful it would be if on this 16.8 acres on the King Mill Pike there was just a group of people that love one another in such a supernatural, marvelous, miraculous way that we display that love to a lost world. I hope that even at this moment, somebody's filling out that tear off section and saying, Yes, I'd like to meet Pastor, you and the others, to know how we can be a more loving church. And maybe there's somebody here today who doesn't have the assurance of their salvation. Lord, I wish that they would either come forward at the invitation or they'd be willing to fill out that tear off section and say, Pastor, I'm not sure. Lord, thank you for this day. Draw us to yourself, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Would you sing with us? Change my heart, O oh God. You come and God leave me.